soon in um, the meetup section, which I think a lot of you have found us by meetup, right? How many of you have used meetup to find us? Yes. We also have an imaging SIG, which you'll learn about tonight, for our uh, astronomers who go out and take pictures of deep sky objects. And we will see some wonderful, wonderful images tonight. I'm really excited. Um, I'd like to know how many people here are new members? Wow, that is incredible. I was going to have you stand up and introduce yourself, but I think we have quite a few more. So instead, I'm going to introduce you to some of our leaders and um, officers. We have Arun, who is our club president. There's Arun. So if you're a new member, Arun is someone you can go up and talk to easily. We have our treasurer, Rob Jaworski. Rob, yeah. Our vice president and our secretary are not here tonight. They're out of the country. And um, I provide snacks and Vinny does the AV equipment. And as I mentioned, Glenn does the imaging um, where he takes people out into at, at dark sky sites and teaches them the process of how to image the night sky. And then we also have Joe Fragola who does the starry nights. Yeah, and Conch there. Yeah, Conch does the in-town star parties and Wolf does solar. So you can actually see him during the daytime. <laughs> Some of the rest of us, you just see at night. <laughs> at this point, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Glenn Newell. And as I mentioned, he is the lead for our imaging uh, outings. And um, come on, Glenn. Yeah, well, I guess I should say a little bit about the two different halves of the imaging program. So, uh, hi, uh, Mervet uh, has the imaging special interest group. So this is a this is an online uh, meeting. We used to have it here pre-COVID, and then it went online, and I think it works out pretty well. So uh, every third Tuesday is a speaker like like this, except it's in this uh, uh, online Zoom meeting and uh, different topic uh, every month about astrophotography, some aspect of astrophotography. So there's that. And then my program, Hands-On Imaging, I call it. And we do a couple different things, usually at a uh, little Uvis open space preserve. So if you've been to our CDO for the Starry Nights program, it's just a little further down the road and a little bit, little bit darker. Um, so uh, I do two different things there. Uh, I do one for the public uh, that's published on Meetup, and generally I I give a lecture and demonstrate some deep space uh, astrophotography. And then uh, other times, so one event a month, and so we kind of alternate two and one and two and one, uh, we'll do just a, a, an imaging event for club members only. And there I won't present anything, but I will be available to help people if they have issues or want you know, tips on their rigs or, or, or whatever. Um, so that's those are the two uh, events. And then uh, also um, many of the visual observing events that the club has are also imager friendly. So as long as you don't, uh, you know, shine your laptop in people's faces or whatever, they've been very good about allowing us to, to image. Uh, so at Mendoza Ranch, at RCDO uh, as well. So um, those are kind of all the the imaging programs that we that we have. 
Um, so with that, I can probably, Peter, can you uh, reach behind the curtain there and, okay, thank you. This has to warm up again, apparently. There we go. Okay, so um, talk a little bit about more what I'm going to talk about on the next slide, but uh, basically, uh, you know, we're going to go through things that you could do with a camera and a, and a tripod, and then we're going to jump into what I call deep space, so things that you would do with a telescope uh, with color filters, and we'll talk about why uh, color filters on a monochrome camera. And uh, then we'll switch over to narrowband imaging um, and what that is and why. And then uh, the sort of the last topic is a completely different approach that we use for planetary, uh, basically solar system objects, including the uh, sun and the moon, in addition to the planets. And that's that's lucky imaging. So those are the the high uh, targets I want to talk about and. Uh, just the the pictures there on the top left, that's the Horsehead Nebula, and that's one that I did from where I'm living now in Union City. So it is possible from a red zone or even a white zone, I've seen it called both, uh, to, to do some narrow band uh, deep spaced astrophotography. Top right is the Whirlpool Galaxy, also taken from uh, Union City. And uh, the bottom there is... Uh, an attendee took this nice picture of me with the horses and and uh, uh, me pointing up at Orion and having Orion on the on the slide there, and that's little Uvis Open Space Preserve where where I talked about having our programs. Okay, so um, this is just the same blurb that was on the meetup, so I won't I won't read it, but I do want to talk about this image on the top left here is the Lagoon Nebula, and that's an image I took in 2014, and that's like the first successful uh, image I, I took. And uh, it actually, it was kind of weird. It, it I happened to be here getting some help from the Fix-It session, uh, and there was a reporter here, and they saw that, and they put it in in the local uh, Cambrian and and uh, Robertsville and all those little little papers at the time. So that was cool. Uh, but then to, to contrast, so then, uh, you know, six years later, that next picture down is the same object, but it's taken with narrowband filters and it's taken remotely from a telescope in Chile. Um, so you can kind of see the difference between starting the hobby and where you, where you can get to. Um, and then the bottom one is, uh, a solar image that I did recently from Union City, and we'll talk more about that later later on. Okay. Um, let's see, I guess my notes don't all fit on the page here with this uh, screen form factor. Oops. Well, I'll do it from memory. Um, so, Astrophotography being both deep and wide topic, right? I'm, I can't cover it all. Uh, and for this particular talk, uh, I'm gonna be focused more on sort of the end result, right? Rather than, you know, you need this type of telescope, this type of camera. So it'll be light on the, on the technique and more kind of a survey of the different types of objects and, uh, I will list all the telescopes used and all that, but it'll be light on the on the technology. Okay, so let's dive in. Uh, so some telescopes that you know I've used, and I've been fortunate to uh, because of the club and and running a program, I've had access to a lot of different uh, telescopes. So you know everything from uh, forty millimeters or now the latest one is this little. Uh, C star here, which is not really serious astrophotography, but what we would call um, uh, electronically assisted astronomy. 
So it sort of sits between visual and, and hardcore imaging. Um, so everything from like 40 millimeters up to uh, 140 millimeters, which is that one in the upper left, riding on top of my 12-inch uh, my RC um, refractor, which is, you know, telescopes with lenses, and then reflectors, uh, everything from 90, the first, the first scope I bought out of a, a catalog, you know, it was my 20th uh, anniversary at work or something, and I had the suitcases and I had the camera. Oh, I, I guess I'll get a telescope, and that was the beginning of the whole thing, right? So, uh, you know, obviously it was, you know, one of these depart department store telescope type things we'd call it, and, you know, it needed a lot of help, but it got me, got me sucked in. So that was a, that was a 90 millimeter uh, Mac CAS, uh, and then other reflectors I've used up to uh, a meter, you know, some of these remote telescopes in, in Chile or Australia or Spain uh, that I've used over the, over the internet. Uh, I've used, started out back in, in the 2014 timeframe, uh, CCD cameras were, were out of my budget. So the, the only other way to do it was with, with DSLRs and these were, uh, astro modified and, and can probably talk about that a little bit. Um, but nowadays you can buy a, an astro camera, a dedicated CMOS astro camera that's cooled and everything. Uh, and that's what everybody does. So pretty much. So that's a, a thing that's changed. So all of those, and then I've used, you know, color and mono cameras, and we'll talk about that and cooled and, and uh, why we use cooled cameras. Okay, um, so with all those telescopes, then there's different instrument packages that you could put on them. And these would have, you know, to create different focal ratios, which, you know, different uh, field of view, they have different optical elements in them. They have, some of them have filters, different types of cameras, uh, a way to guide against the stars to make your tracking of this of the sky more accurate uh, designed for different imaging techniques designed for different exposure links so these are some of the um, different types of objects and the different instrument packages that you would that you would use for them so the deep space and the planetary and even uh, there's things like spec I have a hard time saying this, spectroscopy, uh, which is the different types of lights, the spectrum. Uh, don't talk about that much in, or at all really in this talk, but that's another, that's another citizen science thing you can do in this, uh, in this hobby. And then at the bottom right, there's a couple pictures of different instrument packages that I have at home that I use on these different, on these different telescopes for different purposes. Okay, I want to say a little bit about AstroBin. So AstroBin.com is where a lot of people post their astro images. So it's sort of like kind of like a social media for astro imagers because it's it's also a little bit of a forum. Although there's a really good forum called Cloudy Nights, which is the main forum. But this is where people mostly put their images. And it's also uh, super interesting when you're starting out because you can search for equipment. You can search for images by equipment, right? So if you wanna know what can I do with an eight inch RC or what can I do with an 80 millimeter refractor, you could put that in or even that particular brand, right? To see what pe other people have done with that and what kind of camera they put and all of that stuff. So there's lots of ways to, to do that. And it's a good way to get ideas for images you or you know images you wanna take objects To that on the next page, but uh, Stellarium allows you to 
mock up your your field of view for a given camera, telescope, and optics uh, on the sky over the objects you want to photograph, so you can see which how to rotate the camera and if the field of view is big enough and all of that. Uh, other popular, you know, planetarium is Sky Safari. You can put it on your iPhone, and uh, The image capture software has some sort of framing wizard that can do something similar to uh, Stellarium. And then there are dedicated planning applications. Uh, there's one called Sky Tools for Imaging. There's another one called CCD Guide. And they can produce these uh, graphs like on the right where you can see, well, what time of the year, if I want to do Thor's helmet, what 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 months of the year is good for that. And uh, within those months, uh, when is the moon going to be too close to Thor's helmet to really, you know, take a good picture? So that's what that top graph is on the right is an example of that. And then the bottom one is, um, gee, I need to remember I have my fancy thing here. The bottom one here is uh, over uh, the night. So tonight, you know, where's the moon going to be? Where's my object going to be at what time? So you can kind of plan your your night based on that. And then there's lots of websites that that can do various parts of, of these. Uh, so you can look for that. And then uh, back in the day, <laughs> there are books and magazines, right? So the, the astronomy magazines have, uh, you know, what's up in the sky this month, and they have charts and, and stuff. And then uh, we usually sell, I don't know, are we still doing, are we still selling the art? Royal Astronomy Society Club, maybe? Yeah, of Canada, Canada. Are we still selling those books? Yeah? yeah. Oh, okay. So you, you probably don't need to buy every year, but I would recommend buying one of those, one of their books as a reference guide there's lots of good charts and and uh, lots of explanations of things in there so that's a good resource to have okay uh i talked about this in in stellarium so you know a planetarium is just a, a computer simulation of the night sky or the daytime sky and uh, where you are and all of that and some of them you know you can what does it look like from Mars or Jupiter or something? But I usually just stay here on Earth myself. But, uh, you know, so for instance, in the top, uh, you know, I've got it set up to um, up here, uh, a particular telescope, uh, op, you know, focal reducer and a camera. And then it draws this box, which is the field of view resulting from that. And then I can, uh, you know, put it over an object and also see how I want to rotate the camera on the telescope to to frame it. And if you're doing mosaics, which is where you're going to take, like, see, if, uh, you will see later the uh, Cygnus loop, which is all of these objects right here in one frame, uh, you might have to take depending on your telescope, you might have to take four or five images and composite them together. So that's called a mosaic. So again, you could do your, your planning there. And then the bottom, what I like to do, uh, one of the cool things with Stellarium is you can put your a, a photograph of your landscape or where you where you are in there. So you can see when things are behind trees, when they're behind buildings, when they're going to be where they're easy to photograph. So if you look at that picture, that's actually right outside this building, standing on this first sidewalk here, looking towards the preschool, right? And that's what you would see right now. If you went out there, you would see this view that I have that that picture of. So that's what a planetarium can, can do for you, is tell you what's going on in the sky. Okay. And I promise you, we're, we're going to get to the pictures right about, right about now. Um, so what can you do with just a camera and a tripod? Well, you know, there could be a whole lecture series on what's called nightscapes. 
And if you're interested in, you know, landscape photography and you want to do some of it at night, then I would strongly recommend uh, you look at a site called Photo Pills. A lot of free, really good uh, information on doing nightscapes and also an app that also tells you, you know, if I want to see the moon coming up uh, behind Lick Observatory and at a certain, you know, time, where do I need to stand and, and all of that, Photo Pills will uh, do that for you. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, some of us took a trip down to Lake San Antonio and uh, it's kind of hard to see, but there's actually three different uh, telescope rigs in this, uh, which is what we were there to do, astrophotography. And there's uh, one person in, in the frame there too. But uh, while we were gearing up to do that, I, I took this Milky Way shot. Um, so again, that's a, an eight millimeter fisheye lens, uh, and it was 75 30 second exposures that are then uh, sort of stacked. And you, because the Milky Way will be moving and the ground will not, then you have to, you know, pick one frame for the ground and then marry the two back together, right? So you don't have a blurred um, landscape. Okay, uh, another example of sort of looking up uh, from the from the ground here. Um, this is my all sky camera at the when I did this, it was normally it's on the roof of my house, but I would had it down because I was uh, re doing the the case for it. Uh, I had to replace the dome after a couple years. So it was just sitting on the ground underneath my telescope. You can see my you're looking up at my telescope from the ground. But the point of this is that this is a, a, a composite image of all of the star trails it detected during the during the night when it saw bright things in the sky, it, it stored that and made a, a composite image. So the arcs are just the stars moving on the sky around true north. And then the all the lines that look like a freeway are planes or maybe satellites, but so planes can be dotted or dashed or solid lines and or all three at the same time. But you can see that I'm actually in the uh, flight path for, for Oakland. But what's what's amazing to me is I hardly ever have a problem with this. You know, so I'm taking long exposures all night long. Usually I take 10 minute exposures. And yeah, every once in a while I have to throw one out because it's got this big, you know, plane across it, but it's not really a huge problem. So that's that's unfortunate, I guess. But uh, I just kind of threw this in here because it, it's a cool picture. You can see the high clouds and you can see the the uh, arcs of the stars and you can see the, the planes. Um, Yep. So, and then if you were to automate or, you know, do an all night movie of that. So now we're talking about a time lapse. So this is, you can see the, the bright objects moving are probably planets. I'm betting that's Jupiter down there by the palm tree. And then, uh, you know, you see the clouds come in one way and then the clouds go another way and you can see the planes going. So it's just kind of a cool cool time lapse I thought so I threw that in there and this was th that same camera but up on the roof is where it's supposed to be and the, the reason for that is so I can sit in my office and I can see when it's cloudy and where the clouds are so I don't have to go outside to figure out you know why my guide star just disappeared right okay so then looks like I have to press play on this one. See if I can manage that. So this is this would be an example of a of a nightscape uh, time lapse, and this is pretty primitive. I did this from uh, Pinnacles on a club trip down there, and this is. Uh, just a Canon T3i on a 
on a tripod and I just let it run doing 15 minute exposures, 432 of them to make that sequence that you saw right there. And again, if you wanna get serious about time lapses and nightscapes, there's lots of resources uh, for that. You know, you can get very involved. You can start moving the camera as well, right? So the foreground moves and the stars are moving a different way. And there's all kinds of, you can, you know, paint light. You can paint, uh, you could have painted the tree with a flashlight and, you know, there light, light things in the foreground. There's all kinds of stuff you can do there. So, but my passion is uh, you know, kind of the the deep space. So let's let's get into that deep space objects. And this first section is going to be again uh, with uh, color LRGB filters. So luminance red, green, and blue. And the the luminance there is in parentheses because you could still have long arguments about do we really need to do that at all or not. But I'll leave that for another another time. Um, so why why monochrome cameras? Why not color cameras? So there's kind of three reasons that that come to my mind why you wouldn't want to use just a stock terrestrial camera. They have what's called a Bayer matrix, which I'll explain on the next slide. Uh, they have a stock IR filter that's going to cut some of the stuff you're trying to see in the sky, and they're not cooled. Uh, they heat up as you take long exposures. They heat up if you take video, um, and uh, that adds noise. So the Bayer matrix is on the on the right there. And so the way it works is the sensor is really monochrome. There's no such thing as a color sensor, right? The sensors are all monochrome. But then what they do is they lay this Bayer matrix of filters over the top. So for every four pixels, there's one red, two green, and one blue uh, filter over the top of those four pixels. So right off the bat, you lose some resolution there, right? Because it takes four pixels to make a color pixel. Um, and the other thing uh, we'll talk about more when we get when we get to narrowband is uh, some of the stuff you want to see and separate into different signals so you can see different structures of things are both in the red band. So you can't, you can't separate them out if you've got this Bayer matrix in the way. Uh, the other thing was I talked about was this stock IR filter. So if we look at this, this yellow line here, I don't know if I can press the right button. Um, Right, so this is this is a typical IR response on the on the spectrum for a terrestrial camera, right? So they want to block out infrared uh, light, and um, just because they're focused on what humans see during the day, and they want to duplicate that, so they don't want that that IR stuff in there, so they block it out. The problem is the most interesting thing in the sky that you want to look at, deep space objects, is this H alpha here, this line right here. And so it it's cut off, right, by this filter. So back in the day, again, DSLRs, we were astro-modifying DSLRs, so we were removing that stock filter and either replacing it with a lesser filter or uh, replacing it with just a, a clear glass of the same thickness um, or just not replacing it at all. And it depends on, can it still autofocus? Can it still clean the sensor and all those things based on exactly what modification you did? But that's that's the type of thing we, we did. Um, so then I, I mentioned the noise. So this is just a plot of uh, dark current, which is essentially noise uh, over temperature. And and you can see that it's there's a log scale on the left. see uh, in the spacecraft. So we typically run minus 15, minus 20, minus 25. Um, and that uh, gets rid of a, a lot of noise. Um, 
I did this weird thing. I, I, I had these DSLRs and I actually water cooled them like a, like you would a, a computer, like a gaming machine, right? Water cooled CPU block. So I opened up the back of the camera, put a water block in there and I had, had uh, an ice bath uh, to cool my, my DSLRs. That's how I got started. pretty big um and they're they're colorful right so this is this is awesome so um this these are made up of some of the oldest stars in our galaxy and it's not really fully understood you know these things seem to predate galaxies yet they're associated with galaxies and they tend to orbit like through the galaxy plane back and forth uh, but they're, it's called the uh, the galactic halo is where you normally normally see them, um, and so like I said, it's not it's not totally understood. But we think these are some of the oldest stars uh, that you can see. And I always wonder, you know, if we were on a planet around one of those stars, what would the sky look like? Right, <laughs> you just see zillions of of bright stars packed in there. And uh, so this was um, this was taken uh, remotely from uh, Chile. And so we'll see this telescope over and over again here. This is uh, a company called Telescope Live, and you can rent time on this telescope. Um, and it's a, a plane wave CDK24. So it's a 66 centimeter. Uh, so, you know, it's a big telescope. Um, so I did that, uh, and, uh, it's, um, just let me see if I have the, looks like it was just, uh, because these globs are so, so bright, this was just two 10 minute exposure, uh, for each filter. So it would have been eight times 10 minutes altogether. So it was 80, 80 minutes of total uh, exposure time to make that image. Okay, uh, so you remember we just saw a globular cluster. Well, now we're looking at um, one down here. There's a lot of stuff going on in, in, in this image. Uh, and that's why it's, NGC 6723 and friends. So there's a globular cluster right there. There's a uh, reflection nebula, this blue stuff. There's dark nebula, which is the, the brown here. And then right in the center here is uh, some emission nebulas. So you've really got a lot of stuff going on in this in this picture. And this was taken again, telescope live, Chile, but a, a different telescope. Uh, and this was a uh, a 500 uh, or 50, 500 millimeter, 50 centimeter Newtonian um, telescope, robotically controlled. So that's a pretty wide field. That's sort of 1.4 degrees on the on the sky. Okay. Going back to that CH1 telescope uh, that we did that globular with, here's uh, Sombrero Galaxy. And uh, this is a kind of an unusual galaxy, so they don't really have a, a classification for it, but it's uh, 0.33 degrees across. So if you hold out your, your little finger at arm's length, and look through it to the sky, that's that's about one to 1.5 degrees. So you can think of a little fraction of that that's 0.33, a third of that, right? And this is a Southern Hemisphere object. So again, that's one of the advantages of renting telescopes in the Southern Hemisphere is you get to see objects that you can't see from, from the Northern Hemisphere. So that's kind of cool. Okay, coming back home to Union City, uh, here's the Whirlpool Galaxy taken from my backyard, and that's my 
uh, 12 inch, and I always, I can't pronounce this properly, but uh, Richie Kriteon, uh, it's, a, it's a French name, uh, um, refers to the, the type of telescope, the mirrors are hyperbolic. So the light actually travels through that telescope three times, right? So it comes, let's see, I can do this. So it comes in the front and there's a big mirror at the back, hyperbolic, and it bounces back up to a, another hyperbolic mirror called the secondary here, and then it goes down through the middle and down to the camera. So the focal length is actually three times the physical length of that. And uh, so, and then I'm reducing that with a focal reducer. So I, I'm running that at about uh, 1,932 uh, millimeters focal length. Um, but anyway, so again, this is a monochrome camera with, with uh, RGB filters to create this, this color image. So this, this is a real popular object and, and somehow I had ignored it for years and I finally got around to doing it. I think this was, I read the 2021, apparently I got around to, to doing that. It's, it's, it's really uh, a pretty bright object. I mean, it's cool that it's a, you know, it's an interacting galaxy, right? So there's actually sort of two galaxies there, NGC 5194 and NGC 5195, the little one on the, on the right. So that's a, that's an interesting object. Um, yeah, so it's, it's uh, 228, 300 second exposures. So yeah, so it tracks obviously not all in one night, right? So usually it takes like a week to, for me to get an image. I have kind of a new rule of thumb or new ish rule of thumb for being in that amount of light pollution. I, I'd like to get like 10 hours per filter. So it, it takes a week or two to, to capture that much light. But yeah, the telescope is tracking the sky and the shutters open for 10 minutes at a time. And yes, there's stuff that's keeping it focused and keeping it tracking and all that uh, through all that time. Yeah. They used to, so you, you'll hear the term auto guiding, right? So this is where we have sometimes, no. so sometimes you have a separate scope and a separate camera. Uh, in my case, I, I have something called a an onag, uh, which has a a, a, a a hot mirror, right? So the is that right? Yeah, the the visible light bounces off the mirror, and you see this red camera is at a right angle to the optical train. That's where the actual that's the imaging camera, and then the infrared light goes through the mirror. So there's another camera there on the back and that camera is just looking at a few stars and just making sure that we stay centered on those stars and that's called auto guiding and there's software that that helps you with that that used to be the astronomer with a joystick <laughs> looking in a in a scope a small a separate scope again you know and driving the scope for as long as it took to expose expose that glass plate Right, um, so that was that was manual guiding. That's how they did it back in the day. Okay, here's another galaxy. Um, so Andromeda. This is Andromeda. Uh, it's really big on the on the sky, so you need kind of a short focal length refractor, and so that's what that is down on the uh, lower left there. This was uh, remotely done from Spain. And uh, if you've got a lot of money, uh, a Takahashi FSQ-106 is an awesome uh, telescope for, uh, for wide field. You can't beat it. Um, and again, that's another reason for using scopes remotely is you get access to all kinds of gear that maybe you couldn't afford or and at world-class locations, right? So that's the wide angle view of uh, Andromeda. The bad news about Andromeda is it's going to collide with our galaxy. It's going to be about 25 billion years. 
So that's sort of the good news. And the other good news is they say that, you know, stars are so far apart that you might not even notice, right? Other than the sky would look different, but it'd be very rare that you would get perturbed. But then I see all these pictures of these interacting galaxies and everything swirling around. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> no, but we got 25 billion years to, to worry about that. So uh, there's a, actually another galaxy right here. This is uh, M110 from memory right there. So M31, M110. Yep. Okay. And uh, going back to the Southern Hemisphere, Centaurus A, uh, this I used two different telescopes for. I guess I was in a hurry. Uh, I was probably doing them in parallel. One was getting the luminance data and one was getting the, the color data. And then I put it back together. Um, and this was uh, another remote telescope company called itelescope.net. So there's several to choose from these days. Um, so you can do research on that. And a uh, little bit more information on that. Um, so the little image in the, in the upper right there is a, a NASA image and it's composited with uh, both X-ray data and uh, radio data. So that's that same galaxy has these jets that you, oops, sorry that you uh, that you can't see of uh, in optical, but they're there when you look at them with these other types of uh, wavelengths. Um, and again, this more more data on uh, where I where I took these and all of that. Just in time for Halloween, the ghost nebula from Scotts Valley. Now, one of the things that amazes me about astrophotography is you can find almost anything in the sky, right? You, a little later, we'll see the, you know, God's Eye Nebula and, uh, you know, there's uh, the Statue of Liberty Nebula and all these things that look just, they look so awesome, right? So, you know, there's a lot of really cool things going on in this, you know, there's these little ghosties here and here and there, and then there's this big uh, kind of scary looking thing up here. And uh, one thing I like about this is take a look. I think it's this star right here seems to be shining through a hole in some dust clouds there, uh, like a flashlight on a foggy night or something. So that's that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so I did that when I was living in in Scotts Valley with my my twelve inch uh, RC. Um, so that's an example of a, a globule, which is really just a fancy name for a bunch of dust, right? So the the bright stars are shining and in this case, bouncing off the, the dust and uh, giving us a kind of, makes it look kind of white from, from where we are. Usually uh, globules are, are dark because they're blocking light. Okay, this is the last of the, the RGB stuff. So, um, and I have a, an example of a metal print from this here. You can look at if you want later. Uh, they make metal prints in, in glossy make a pretty good uh, medium to, to uh, print on. Um, so this, uh, was inspired. So th there's a there's a gentleman that's a club member uh, that teaches classes on astrophotography. Has some books, uh, Rogelio Bernal, and Andrio. Uh, and in one of his books, which which I came to a talk here, he gave a talk, and I bought bought his book, and he signed it. It was cool. And he has uh, a uh, shot. And uh, this is actually three, it's a mosaic, three frames, right? So if you think of, uh, you know, like this is one and then one in the middle here 
and then one on the end. And there's a lot of stuff going on in this, right? So this is M43, the great nebula in Orion, or M42, sorry, M43, the running man, uh, and then the Horsehead Nebula, and uh, this little whitish thing here, you'll see better in a minute, is uh, NGC 2023. It's actually one of my favorite objects, but it's really hard to photograph. So there's lots of cool stuff uh, going on there. So this actually took me a couple years to put this together, uh, mainly just because I had to, to wait because I was like at the end of the season for this target and I had to wait for it to come around again. Um, but yeah, it's, it's about 10 hours of, of data. Um, if I redid this, I'd probably do like you know, a hundred hours or something crazy, but yeah. Um, so that's a favorite of mine. So now let's dive into uh, what we call narrow band filters. Okay. And that's the Rosette Nebula. I believe that one's from my backyard uh, with a 80 millimeter refractor. So what are we talking about? So um, I guess it's a little washed out. Hmm. Well, there's, and I keep pressing the wrong button. Oh, there, that's better. So th this light red here would be like the bandwidth of a red filter that we, we would have used in all those previous images, right? We would have used a red filter and then a green filter and a blue filter on, on the same target uh, to make those color images from a mono camera. But I mentioned before when I was talking about the Bayer matrix, the problem is, you know, two of the signals that we get from emission nebulas, uh, they're glowing in hydrogen alpha and different structures in the nebula are being energized in sulfur too. And they're both inside the red filter. So if I made them both red, then you're missing, you know, half the fun, right? So what we do is we randomly assign, yeah, we take, uh, we, we have a filter that's narrow enough just to get the, the sulfur two separate from the HA, and we randomly assign them some color when we process it so that we can see the difference between those two. And then the, the other challenge is oxygen three is the, the, the other most popular uh, filter for, for astrophotographers, amateurs. And you see here, it's right between green and, and blue. So it, it comes out sort of cyan if you uh, don't, don't do something different with it. So again, we have narrow band filters for oxygen three, HA and S2, and then we assign them. So we, it could be called false color, right? And the reason that we do that again is so that you can see the different structures, uh, see the, uh, in, in the, uh, in the nebula in different colors. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, so this is the Crab Nebula. So this is a supernova remnant, I believe, that was actually documented in uh, by Chinese astronomers. Oh, it's there on the slide. Documented by Chinese astronomers in uh, 1054. And I don't know why this thing keeps doing that. Um, so star blew up, this is what's left. Um, and so I put the, the Hubble image, so their uh, false color image of what that looks like. And then there's my version from Scotts Valley probably. And then 
you can see if I had done it in uh, RGB, it's not nearly as as interesting, right? So again, that's why we we do the false color. So having said that, here we go with narrowband imaging. Uh, so this is just we we saw M forty two, the Great Nebula, and Orion a little bit ago uh, in that mosaic. Uh, so here it is just by itself. This is a popular target for astrophotographers starting out because it's big and it's bright. Uh, in fact, it's a little too bright, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, this particular image, I was actually just kind of goofing around. Uh, the club was donated the, the white scope you see there in the lower left riding on top of my 12-inch uh, uh, RC. So that's a uh, Vixen 140, 140 uh, millimeter diameter uh, Petzval, if I'm pronouncing that right. So it's a four element lens refractor. So that's, refractors don't get much bigger than that. They, you know, there's 152s and, but that's, that's about it. Um, so that's a pretty big, big refractor. So, um, um, so this was, this was just kind of a test image uh, because it was set up for visual and to take all the stuff off the back and and remake uh, 3D print adapters uh, to hold the focuser that's electronic that has all my camera stuff on it. But then it turns out that the focuser also held the fourth uh, lens element. So I had to make this pretty complicated uh, piece, 3D print that that threads in the scope, the lens element threads in that, and then the focuser threads on, on that. So anyway, it's pretty, it's a pretty awesome scope. So there's that. Okay, and then we talked about the Horsehead Nebula. So here's a, a close up of that with uh, my 12 inch uh, RC. And again, this, this little nebula here, this NGC 2023, it's, it's got some cool colors and some cool features. And uh, I, I've rarely seen uh, any larger than that, uh, but I keep, I keep wanting to uh, go back and get a, better, get a better image of that. That's one of my favorite uh, images. But this, this was 28 hours, uh, again, from light polluted Union City. So that's not surprising that it took that long, but. Okay, here's something a little different. So this image, one of, one of the techniques for processing these images, uh, and especially these days that you can do this a lot easier than you could before was to remove the stars. So, and then process the starless image just optimized for all the nebula stuff, nebulosity. And then if you want the stars, you can you know process them separately not stretch them so much is, is what we're talking about and then put them back together. Uh, in this particular case, I liked it without the stars. So this is, <laughs> this is a starless uh, image of the Tadpoles Nebula. So you can see kind of why it's called the Tadpoles Nebula in the upper right there, right? So uh, they think those are probably star forming regions, uh, but they're, they're just uh, bunches of dust. And again, the 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 stars forming there are making them uh, glow essentially. Um, okay, do I want? To, I think that's all I want to say about that. Okay, here's another starless image. Um, so as as I say here in the comments, this is the. Uh, both halves of the Veil Nebula, or, or it's called the Cygnus Loop when it's when it's all together. There's actually a lot of different little pieces to this, Pickering's Triangle and all this stuff. But all together like this, it's it's Cygnus Loop. And I was working on this image and I was turning it, you know, which way do I want to show it? And and I had it starless at the at the moment. And then suddenly I saw like, and there's this big dragon there. You know, it's like here's the dragon's head and he's got a wing out here and he's got a wing out here and then here's his long body and the tail. So that's pretty cool. So I just left it, left it like that. Um, so I, I had to, when I put on Astrobin, I had to say, you know, this is a little on the art side, not so much on the science, uh, just so I didn't get, get ragged on, but yeah. 
Uh, here's what it would look like with some stars. Uh, right, so again, and the story behind this object. Uh, oh, I have a Palomar shirt on. So I was visiting uh, the Palomar Observatory and you know they have a, you can see the telescope upstairs, downstairs, it might even be in a separate building, I forget now. But uh, you know they have a, a museum and it's got dis things displayed in it that are probably you know 50 years old or something now, right? So they're not not in the best of shape. But so there was an image kind of similar to to this where it was kind of dusty and old and and I looked at that and I said that's a cool object, but I bet I can take a better picture <laughs> than they took from the Palomar. So that's that's what I set out to do. And this is one of these objects that I keep going back to. If you look at my astro bin, you'll see bunches of versions of this. Um, so that's the Veil Nebula. This is one of my favorite objects, Thor's helmet. Okay, and so this is again from that CH1 telescope in Chile. And so what's going on here is, uh, there's what's called a wolf rayet star right there that's lighting, get this out of the way, that's lighting all of this up from the inside. And so that thing, uh, you know, went supernova and blew this stuff out and now it's shining and making all that stuff emit in uh, hydrogen alpha and uh, some sulfur and oxygen three. And so this is uh, this just, I like this image a lot. This is one of my favorite uh, targets. So you'll see versions of this on my, on my site as well. This is the running chicken nebula. Does anybody see the running chicken? It's actually kind of, I think it's going sideways, right? So it's, that's its head. Right, so there's sort of this chicken shape here and then these Bach globules are kind of forming the feet, I think. That's at least what I see, I don't know. Uh, that's like the, the wizard nebula. I never understood why it's a wizard nebula. I know, what, is, what is it? And somebody turned it like this and it's like, oh, you gotta turn it sideways. It's a wizard nebula. Okay, so uh, that's the running chicken nebula. This is a popular astrophotography target, the Crescent Nebula. This one I took from Union City with my my 12 inch RC. And uh, another target that I go back and back to, uh, this one I had bought some new, uh, more narrow, so three nanometer uh, filters. Uh, prices have come down on some of these things, you know, the CMOS cameras and the the fancy filters, narrow band, super narrow band filters, prices coming down. Um, so I was able to to get those and and again assist with uh, getting better narrow band images from my light polluted uh, backyard. And again, there's a Wolf Rayet star right there. You can kind of see there. All the way. Um, you can kind of see the diffraction spikes on a, a star right there. And so that's the the supernova that that blew up and and created this thing. Uh, somewhere between twenty five thousand, I'm sorry, two hundred and fifty thousand and four hundred thousand years ago. And this is about uh, five thousand light years from Earth. Okay, who knows what this is? Pillars of creation. So down in the lower left there, you see from 1995, there's newer, better images now with, with even from Hubble and then from James Webb of the pillars of creation. So it's it's part of the Eagle Nebula. Um, so here's my version, uh, again, from, uh, from light polluted.
the large star forming regions uh, there that are light. This, this whole thing from the inside, this is a bright emission nebula in the Sagittarius arm of the galaxy. So Wikipedia says, uh, episodes of star formation are thought to contribute to the complex and suggestive shapes. Powerful winds from the nebula's embedded young massive stars shape the looping filaments. Everything's so diffuse, right? It's only because you see it from a from a distance that you can get all this structure and and uh, see the mm -hmm. the emission from it. Ah, oh, what does this look like? Yeah, this is the Helix Nebula, and you know, sort of the slang name or whatever, the common name, God's God's Eye Nebula, and I mean, that's an eye, <laughs> right? I mean. So this, this is an example of a planetary nebula. Well, so you say, what is a planetary nebula? What has it got to do with planets? Nothing, has absolutely nothing to do with planets. They just thought maybe they were planetary because they were small and bright. Um, they're usually very challenging objects because they are very small on the sky. This is the biggest one that uh, they found. Um, and so it's a popular, it's a popular target. But yeah, planetary objects, uh, region of cosmic gas and dust formed from the cast off outer layers of a dying star. Despite their name, planetary nebula have nothing to do with planets. So this is one that's uh, only 650 light years distance, which is why it's so big on the sky. Okay. Now it's time to back off our focal length a little bit and go a little wider. So these next two are going to be uh, wide field, what I call wide field targets. So in the picture on the lower left, again, writing on top of my, my long focal length scope is a uh, 80 millimeter refractor, which I bought in this room at a swap meet, hint, hint, for $400. Um, so it's a it's a triplet, um, and again, you know, it, uh, you can see all the all the instrument package stuff here, and you know, focuser and rotator and the onag I talked about, and all kinds of electronics and stuff. So put all that stuff on there, and um, got this uh, picture of the rosette rosette nebula. Um, so yeah, almost 14 hours of data from, from um, Union City. And all Wikipedia has to say about this, it's an H2 region. Well, geez, that's a, it's an amazing, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in there. Uh, and so it's an open uh, star cluster. So we talked about globulars being, you know, the very tight, uh, star cluster we started with. So an open star cluster is just a looser uh, collection of, of stars, and they, they, they might not even be associated with one another, right? They might be really far away from each other, and they just look like they're close together because we're looking at it uh, end on. Um, but anyway, they say this is a, a, a open cluster NGC 2244 closely associated with the nebulosity. So they're not really telling us exactly what's been what's going on there. The uh, stars of the cluster having been formed from the nebula's matter. So that's said, saying it's a star forming region, essentially. Okay. Um, so here's, uh, I named this a mighty roar in the sky. So do you see the lion there? Yeah, let's see, I think I pressed the wrong button. See, this is his head and mane, and then he's got his front and back legs and his other back leg and his tail sticking up there. Oh, you can see his mouth open, right? Here's his rawr. Yeah, just out of the way. So another uh, a wide field target um, with that uh, short focal length refractor. Okay, 
So now we're going to completely change the method and the topics here, and we're going to go look at some solar system objects. And so instead of long exposure, we're going to do the exact opposite now. We're going to do what's called lucky imaging. And instead of taking long exposures, we're going to take the absolute minimum exposure that we can. These, these objects are very bright, like the sun. This is the sun we're looking at. That's obviously very bright. Um, and it, if you, well, let's go ahead and jump to the next. If you look at the, at the moon through a telescope, you'll see it coming in and out of focus and it's going like this, right? And that's because of the, the turbulence in the upper atmosphere, right? And in the case of the sun, when you're imaging the sun, you get the same effect, but it's actually from heat coming off of the, the ground. Like when you look at a hot road in the distance, you know, you see those heat waves coming up. So in the case of solar imaging, you need to be concerned about the turb turbulence on the ground. And for everything else, it's it's way high up in, in the atmosphere. But you, know, you couldn't get a whole image like this to be in focus at the same time because of this roiling atmosphere. So what you do is you take as short an, a video, you know, a video frame as possible. And then there's software that goes through all those frames and all the different areas of what you're taking a picture of and figure out when it's in focus. So it's like, when is the contrast the highest in this region? You know, some, some stand in for, for focus, right? And then it goes and stitches that all together to create an image. And that's why we call it lucky imaging, right? So again, super short exposures, um, uh, high F ratios, um, I remember being impressed viewing the uh, the nickel telescope at uh, Lick, um, and she was describing, well, you know, there are these different instrument packages. There's the Cassegrain package that goes there, and then there's another one that goes up where the secondary is, and then, oh, yeah, and if we want to shoot planets at F39, uh, down the hallway in the basement <laughs> is where we put the camera, right? So it, goes down the hallway in the basement to, to make a focal length that long for F39 for, for planets. So anyway, again, different instrument packages. So the moon, uh, I did this uh, recently, and this particular one happens to be uh, two images put together, a mosaic, because the moon won't fit in my uh, field of view from for the RC. In fact, it's still chopped off there on the left a little bit. But um, I did this while I was actually, you know, waiting for my target to rise that I was serious about taking. So anyway, I did this moon, this moon thing. So, uh, so uh, two frames. So each one was a, a thousand frames of, of video and then you process it all and put it back together. Okay, so here is a full disc image of the sun. Uh, again, from Union City, and this is from a, a Coronado PST, which stands for Personal Solar Telescope, which is a visual scope, and you have to work kind of hard at it to get it to be an imaging scope, but I've done a lot of stuff to it uh, to get to get images like this. So, and you can see there's, and, and Wolf is here to keep me honest on you know, there's like a, a glossary, two-page glossary of all the names of all the different stuff going on on the sun, right? You've got sunspots and specules and filaments and prominences and all that stuff. So the, around the outside, we have prominences and the dark stuff is, the dark dots are, are sunspots. And then the, you know, you can see the texture of the, of the surface of the, of the sun there. Um, so that's full disk in, in one uh, image. And then here, that same 80, Miller, uh, 80 millimeter telescope that I was using for deep space with a different, a bunch of different stuff on, on it, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, adapting it for, for solar. So then I get a close up view. And so here we have an example of some sunspots there on the, on the bottom. And then this prominence, which looks like a big fist, right, coming up. That was a pretty cool one. And then uh, 
I call this the solar swoop. And you can see that it's starting sort of in the foreground on the surface there and uh, swooping up. So I was pretty happy with, with that. And again, that's with that, that uh, 80 millimeter um, scope modified for H alpha. So this is what it looks like. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff going on here. So there's um, 3D printed filter holder for uh, what we call an energy rejection filter just to knock down the amount of energy going in there. And so I just have a, a yellow uh, filter, used yellow filter. Um, and then this is the, the 80 millimeter refractor and then a bunch of uh, space and then uh, the the uh, focuser and um, the uh, H alpha solar filter that I have is called a camera quark. It was designed to go on a telescope and a DSLR, so it has Canon bayonet fittings on both ends. So I have to, to use it, I have to adapt both ways to, to Canon bayonet and back. Um, and then um, there's, um, there's this thing that happens called Newton's rings, right? So if you have a, a sensor that's perfectly parallel to your, to your H alpha filter, you can get this reflection bouncing back and forth between them that creates an interference pattern. It looks kind of like a, a Fresnel lens. So series of rings, dark and light over the top of your image. So what you need to do is tilt your camera a little bit uh, so that that can't reinforce, right? So that it bounces off. Um, and what I've done instead of doing that is I bought a four degree uh, tilt prism and I've got that mounted in there. Um, and so that's my, that's my solar rig. Um, so how are we doing on time? Good. So, uh, you know, kind of did a, a, a survey of uh, a lot of different objects and a little bit very lightly about different techniques and types of telescopes and cameras. So yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, I can tell you about these these images that didn't, except for Andromeda, I guess, didn't make it into the main proposal. Uh, clockwise starting in the upper left. That is also apropos for this time of the year. That's the Witch Head Nebula. Can you see that? Witch had nebula there. That's kind of a close-up of a profile of her, her face. Okay, and then uh, we have Andromeda and then um, another uh, planetary nebula, the Dumbbell Nebula, and then uh, the Tarantula Nebula. That's a, uh, a Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and that was something I did early on with itelescope.net. Okay, and uh, yeah, that's the Spaghetti Nebula. Uh, that's from Spain. And uh, yeah, that's me uh, looking in my All Sky camera on the roof. <laughs> so thank you. And uh, there we go. I'll take questions if anybody has any questions. Sure, yeah, we could do lights. Yeah. How many what, telescopes? Uh, yeah, next question, yeah. There's a few telescopes and mounts and yeah, I, I'm over overloaded, but. put it in the case. That's problematic again for astrophotography. 
I mean, nowadays you've got some stuff more like more like this, uh, um, where things are getting you know more integrated. But uh, I do want to um, try to do something to have more more like a loner astrophotography thing. Figure out how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah. You said you would go back and take 100 hours for the one on the region there. Yeah. What would you try to do there? So, what do you do after you feel like you've done everything, right? So, what people tend to do is they try to go deeper, so more hours, right? So, you try to get more, more detail, more contrast, or, more so or go wider. They do like, giant swaths of the sky with, with a mosaic or something. And that's what Rogelio inspired me to do. And, and he's done, you know, like there's things that, so you look, you look at my picture of uh, M31, right? And it's a galaxy on a black sky with stars. So Rogelio went and did it for, I don't know how many hours. And he started to see, you know, there's this hydrogen gas and dust out there. Right. And he actually got in a fight with with, you know, professional astronomers that say, oh, that's not you wow. are making that up. You're doing it in post processing, you know, but now it's an accepted fact that there's like this hydrogen gas floating around out by Andromeda. And that's just happened, you know, right here in this club. But so. So, yeah, you can find you can find stuff. You know, there's um, the soap bubble nebula near the crescent nebula. You know, somebody just, an amateur astronomer discovered that. And the squid nebula uh, discovered by an amateur astronomer. So, yeah, you keep, keep trying to see new things and, and uh, yeah, go, go deep. <laughs> yeah. Questions from the So I don't do a lot of visual observing, but um, what we're doing, you mentioned one of them, right? We have these narrowband filters so that we can assign the different emissions of emission nebulas to different colors so you can see the different structures. But we're also doing, you know, we're taking these long exposures and then we're, we're what's called stacking, right? So we're getting uh, 10 hours or 100 hours or something exposure. You know, your eye cannot gather that amount of light in real time. So you're able to see more, you know, and I, I don't know, maybe I'm an astrophotography snob, but, you know, up at Lick, and the biggest telescope I've ever looked through was the, what is it, 36 inches, the great, great refractor at Lick. And I'm like, yeah, it's a galaxy. Well, you know, I can do, I can do better than that at home. And it's because I get 10 hours of the galaxy versus, you know, looking at it with your eye in real time. Now that's a great view, right? From that, that telescope, but it's a great visual view, but you can you can do more with you with the camera. Well, again, this is sort of the, the new thing, right? So this is a five hundred dollar box. You throw it out on the lawn and you operate it with your smartphone and say, I want to see the Helix Nebula and it'll go and it'll find it and it'll start taking 10, 10 second exposures and stacking them up over, you know, five or 10 minutes and you'll actually start to see some pretty good, you know, better, it, where's Joe? It's better than, better than visual, yeah? Yeah. Better than what you see through a visual scope. Not as nice as the long exposure stuff, but, you know, for 500 bucks, and, you know, it's very accessible. So this is very, very interesting. Um, yeah. How would you recommend you know, for like somebody getting into us? Yeah, so I think it's very powerful for two for two things. One is an outreach tool. Um and uh you know I've worked on on ways of uh so that 
and the different manufacturers have some capability here, but um, sharing the image to, to a bunch of phones, so all the people, you know, or getting it up on a projector or whatever, right, for outreach. And also, yeah, for, for a beginning astronomer, yeah, I think it's very accessible. Um, yeah, I haven't, I've, I've had this about two weeks, I think, yeah, just before the eclipse. Yeah, and I used it for the eclipse out here. Did it good? It comes with a solar filter um, for free included. Um, so that was cool. Because it could see through the through the clouds better than my my H alpha scope, right? Because the clouds are make it black essentially. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's gonna be kind of a game changer for for the hobby for a lot of people. What is that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> This is a ZWO C Star. It's a brand new product. People, you know, pre-ordered them for four hundred dollars uh, back in the April May timeframe, and they're just starting to arrive now. To buy them now, it's it's been regular prices, but I think well four ninety nine. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, might might be a good way to to, to start uh, start the hobby. Um, you know, I, I had tried electronically assisted astronomy before, which essentially means using, you know, a, a video camera on a, on a telescope. And at that time, it was literally an, an analog video camera. And there was as much complexity to that part of the hobby or, or, maybe more so, I thought, than the traditional stuff. So I poo pooed it. I mean, I still have this Malincam supposedly amazing analog video thing. But um, but again, the, this is part of the technology just since I started in 2014 that it has really changed. Um, How long have been on? Uh, so they're just, they're just shipping now. So this is, there are other uh, there are other products in this space. Probably I can think of three other manufacturers, and they might each have a couple different models. But other than there's something called the Dwarf Two, which I I, I think is close to this price. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but the the other ones are are quite a bit more expensive. So I mean. ZWO, you know, if you look at their, their product lines, you know, first they had cameras and then they had the, the ASI Air, which is a little Raspberry Pi computer, which brings all the software that you need. You know, in my other talks, I talk about, you know, you need six different pieces of software and they all have to talk at the same time to the hardware and get along with each other. And, and you have to keep them all updated and all of that. So ASI Air is more like an appliance. Right, so it's got all that stuff in it, and you operate it with your cell phone. Um, and then they made a focuser, and then they made a mount. Well, now they've got all the pieces they need. Oh, and and filter wheels. They've made filter wheels all along. So now you know this is uh, an alt as mount. It's got a focusing mechanism. It's got not a filter wheel, but a filter slider. Um, and it's got a computer that controls everything with your cell phone and it, yeah, and filters and, you know, it does, it, it's, well, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how to use the process? That's probably the hardest part of this thing. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've gone through a lot of different uh, tools. I'm still using Photoshop. Uh, although there's now Affinity Pro, which is a sort of a less expensive or maybe not so much subscription versus you can buy it, I think. One time, where's Rob? He's going to be throwing stuff at me. Here he is. Rob works at Adobe. Um, uh, so I still use Photoshop uh, for the for the back end, and that's where it gets sort of more artsy. And, and I have a lot of plugins and... and uh, uh, some uh, actions that I've written. Uh, and then these days I'm using PixInsight, which is what, you know, pretty much everybody uses. 
to do the the stacking, but I will admit to Pix Insight is like a whole uh, you know you could you could have like a PhD in Pix Insight or something, right? Um, honestly, I just use the uh, the two um, batch scripts. So there's weighted batch pre-processing. And there's, uh, depending on what I'm doing, I use that or or for a lot of the stuff that I'm getting from these robotic telescopes, I use a, a script called auto integrate. And it's kind of just a push button thing. So you get the, you put in all the images from the telescope and you press the button and you get something that can then go into Photoshop. Now you can stay in Pix Inside and do all these other processes, but at that point I tend to save it as a 16-bit TIFF and jump into, into Photoshop. But yeah, to say to say more about all the processing would be a whole lecture in itself. But yeah, there's lots of lots of resources. So the compelled stuff, I'm kind of curious about, you know, the remote scope. In, yeah. In Chile and Spain, like, you know, how much does that cost and what's the wait time that you find to get on the list? So, when I was using itelescope.net, uh, they had about, I think, 30 seems like a big number, but they had, certainly they were numbered that high. They had quite a few, they had quite a few telescopes. And so it was usually you could find, you know, they let you go in in like a calendar and, you know, I want three hours on this telescope at this time. And then you, you can either drive it manually I don't know why you would, but, or you can tell it, you know, I want M31, uh, this, this many red, this many green, this many blue for this line exposure, and then it'll just go do it. So, the, so I got a lot of things I want to say that the, the downside of that is if you're somebody who likes to fiddle and, you know, work with the equipment and hands on, and you like being out under the night sky, Maybe that's not the right way to go, but for me, it's an extension, right? It's another thing I can do. I can do it when, when it's cloudy or, you know, I can get access to these big scopes I could never afford, uh, you know, from these world-class locations. Um, so they, I, I had stopped using them maybe five years back and switched over to Telescope Live and they have a kind of a different system. And what I'm doing on Telescope Live now is I don't even program their their scopes. I just like take the data that they they have what they call these one click observations. So they they have like um, an hour's worth of data on some object, and then maybe a couple months later they'll they'll do it again. And so it, at at the end of it you might have 20 hours of data on, a, on an object and you can download it for like five bucks or something, you know? So I pay, I think I pay like 20 bucks a month no. for, for Telescope mm -hmm. Live. No. There's different tiers, no. but I, I stopped, on this. you know, programming the scopes and just, mm -hmm. I've got this huge library now okay. of one click data that I go and, and process for a long time. So, so again, you know, it's not me out under the night sky and fiddling with gear and 3D printing adapters and all of that stuff, which but I do those things anyway, but it, it extends my reach and, you know, allows me to do more things. Yeah, you, you go and do the research, I guess, for what it costs nowadays. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. So plate solving, man. Plates. So I am not a visual observer. I don't know how to star hop. Okay, I cannot find stuff in the sky. And and it's you know that's a shame. I should. And it's embarrassing when I go out and give talks and it's like I don't even know you know let's. Where, right? And these guys, well, how about that? You know, oh. <laughs> but yeah. because I have gone so deep in some of these other, you know, topics, right? right? But, so I'm not, I'm not proud of that. But that's the reality. 
Yeah, so, so plate solving used to be this huge pain in the butt. Oh my God, in the software, um, uh, there's this thing called astrotortilla, right? And it sort of kind of works sometimes, and you have to have the right data files, and you have to have the right version of astrotortilla because the other one had bugs and all this stuff. But man, the first time I got that to work, oh my God. Because it's like, you know, go to M31, and it just, it goes and we got to where it thinks M31 is, and it takes a picture. And, and what plate solving means is so, remember, I mentioned earlier the glass plates, right? That's how they used to use, they put film emulsion, emulsion on glass plates, and that was the, the photograph that they put in, in the telescope. So, solving the plate or plate solving means where in the sky is that? That that plate is of right. So so now we have this software, and now it's you know in the ASI air, and it's pretty much commodity now, right? So your 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 scope, your, your by scope I mean a telescope and a mount. Your mount thinks it knows where things are, and it's only so accurate, right? So you'd say go to M thirty one. So it goes to where it thinks M thirty one is, but it's off. So visually. You know, you would you would be magging up, right? You'd have a wide field eyepiece, and you go, oh well, it's over there, and so I'll get a little closer, and then put a bigger eyepiece in, a little closer, a little closer. So with plate solving, you know, takes a picture and goes, oh, your model of the sky is off. You need to correct it, right? So it'll correct the model of the sky in your mount, right, and then re go to, and then take another image and repeat that process, and it'll do it however many times. And you tell it till you're within, you know, so many arc minutes or arc seconds or whatever, right? So that's plate solving, and it used to be a big hairy deal, and now it's like a big deal. You just have to make sure you're in focus, and you can plate solve most of the time. Yeah, so that's that was a huge. Yeah, that that was a big barrier to the hobby was getting on 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 a target. Yeah. Planetary is another because you can't plate solve onto a onto a planet. That's a that's another thing. But yeah. Okay. So I think it was yeah. It is. Yeah. So uh, there's uh, diffraction gratings, which are inexpensive, maybe around a hundred dollars to start, I think. Uh, and there's. Uh, this one guy that 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 um, makes this software RSpec that you can use to calibrate and do a lot of measurements and uh, and he's given a talk for us and he has lots of of YouTube uh, explanations. I'm forgetting. I want to say maybe Rainbow Optics. I don't know. He has this funny crown hat that he wears as part of his stick. But, uh, <laughs> Hair in a in a rainbow. Um, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I I oh well, we got the expert right here. Tell us about Spectre. <laughs> he made one. Uh, a spect. What is it called? I can't. Spectrograph. Spectrograph thank you. And he measures, you know, how good your telescope is with that thing and how good your filters are. And he, he has his own YouTube channel. And so there you go. If you want to know about, yeah, <laughs> subscribe, <laughs> hit like, so you get the bell. Yeah, hit the bell. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's lots of citizen science stuff that you can do. There's lots of little corners to this hobby. You can hunt for exoplanets, no lie. There's, there were kids, high school kids in this club that found exoplanets and developed, helped develop the software pipeline at NASA for finding exoplanets out of this club. Started in their backyards. Yeah, so uh, finding exoplanets, uh, so, um, I have a whole a whole slide on all the different uh, uh, citizen science stuff. You know, finding comets, finding asteroids, tracking near Earth objects, um, 
what's the thing for the study of brightness? Um, uh, photometry, thank you. So there's a whole section of, you know, how bright things are, which can be used for finding exoplanets is one of the techniques, right? Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of, of sciencey things you can do besides just straight out making kind of pretty pictures, yeah. For me, it's kind of the, it's like a, a perfect storm of, of geekiness, right? It's, it's software and hardware and just a little bit of art, you know, and it's, yeah, so it really hits all the buttons for me somehow. So yeah, a lot of 3D printing. I do a lot of 3D printing of telescope parts, but yeah. Okay. Okay, great. She's got the hook. <laughs> I've passed out some satisfaction surveys. We use this hall um, thanks to the city of San Jose. And so to be good um, tenants, we like to comply with their satisfaction requirements. And some of you in the front didn't get them. I have to go to Kinko's and make some more. But for those of you who have them, they're very brief. If you could fill them out and put them in the black box at back, we'd really appreciate it. Um, I want to say that up until about five years ago, I relied on Hubble for my big wow photographs of space. And now almost exclusively, I rely on the imaging SIG. And we've had people join that SIG from out of the locale here because they, uh, one fellow said, they're so knowledgeable and so friendly that out of all the places I tried to find astrophotography info, this is it. So it, it was a big compliment to, to our astroimaging group. Um, so with that, thank you for coming and come again.